2024 J gets better taste. I married you. Does that mean I have bad taste? Brennan Lee Mulligan is an individual that many look up to, and for good reason. Having been on countless hours of TTRPG actual plays, tons of entertainment content, and a guest host for some of the largest gaming spaces in the world, it's no surprise that many wish to emulate his charismatic style and techniques. Um, your arm touching the tree. Uh, are you weakest, do you feel, at the elbow or the shoulder? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you gotta cut this shit out, man. Having watched his content on my own as well, I can say for certain there is a lot of good things to emulate, and I have found my own style running games taking cues and hints from him as well. But there's one technique in particular, a method he uses frequently, that I find to be one of his most evocative, and also one I would caution anyone on using. That technique is his ability to tear down characters to their very core, to leave them dying just by speaking. I don't know because he knows I'll put on a fucking show at that tournament. Oh, yes! <laughs> just start swinging. She goes, oh. You like, oh, smash! Chandelier smashes. She goes, oh. what's wrong with you? By the ball above, who did I marry? Now, before we get into this, sit down. Have a seat. I need to talk to you about something. We've had some fun uh, with this whole Spoiler warning thing. We've had some goofs and gas who showed me going crazy and losing my mind. But there's been squirrels. A lot of squirrels. But we don't gotta do that anymore. It was funny. It ran its course. We're done now. We can move on. We don't have to be trapped by this anymore. We're free. I'm free. I'm not suffering a psychotic break. I'm not losing my mind. You're losing your mind. And we're, we're just fine with that. Oh, we can just put one squirrel. One squirrel, just really Two, maybe two, maybe two squirrels. Just, just, okay, three, just the third one. Just for the sake. Just. There is no war, Bossing Say. There, perfect. Topical reference. Everyone will get it. Now, what do I mean by tearing characters down to their core? Well, I've already shown one example. Let's talk about some more. Never After is a Dimension 20 campaign focusing around fairy tales and the horror that can come from within them. Honestly, I don't feel the need to explain a lot of it because I've already done so in several videos at this point. I've broken down several points of it. I'm gonna be honest. I've talked about it. If you wanna know more about it, either go watch the trailer, watch the show, or watch some of my previous videos. But one of my favorite characters from the story, and it should be no surprise, is Gerard, otherwise known as the Frog Prince. He's, um, he's not my favorite for any particular reason. I just kind of like frogs. What about frogs? I like frogs. Once cured of his curse by true love, he has now been returned to his human form, or at least a halfway human form. This is because of his love beginning to run dry in a loveless marriage that falls to pieces. And it's in this state that we find him confronted by the magical illusion of one of the main antagonists, Rapunzel. You see the Princess Rapunzel looking at you. You're a prince. Friends are probably pretty expendable, right? How many friends have you really had other than Elodie? I mean, uh, overall, not, not very many, but... Your friends seem to really value you as a person. And I'm sure it's a comfort to know that they're not just sort of putting up with you because you'll tag along and swing your sword, prove a little bit useful. I, I like to think that we have a, um, a rapport. I'm not sure what your plans are. I was hoping to get an image of you up to some kind of scheming rather than hiding from a bird and the edge of a lake, but I suppose I can't be too surprised. I have seen some titanic feats of strength from my companions. The Beast, Cinderella, Snow White. Truly impressive acts of heroism. I do not think I have seen any of my sisters strain more greatly 
than the Princess Elodie to find something kind to say about you. Yes, Gerard. What do you think the odds are that it got into Elodie's head that the virtuous thing to do was to fall in love with a cold and slimy frog and that every kindness she has paid you in your life has been a testament to her charity rather than anything about you that would bring her joy. I don't know that I can answer that. It doesn't seem very fair to Elodie that you can't. This is what I mean by tearing them down to their very core. One of the things that Brennan does that I find absolutely fascinating and brutal to watch is his ability to find the central weakness of the character and bears it for the world to see. Many times when we create our characters, we find a weakness that we find very compelling. It's something that we lean into. We want our characters to be flawed because well, let's be honest, a flawed character is an interesting one. It's one you can root for because there's something for them to overcome. But having that flaw laid bare for everybody else to see is something that is painful. And the way that Brendan does it is often filled with just toxins and venom and pure vitriol towards the character. You can tell that the villains genuinely hate the characters, or sometimes even the NPCs. But why do this? Well, the truth is, is it contextualizes the barriers that the character needs to overcome to complete their arc. Many times it's difficult to figure out where your arc is going to go, and it's difficult for the audience to see it. But when you have somebody so brutally tear a character apart and show their main weakness that they're going to have to overcome, you cannot do anything but help to root for them, to hope that they're going to overcome it, to really want them to prove that NPC wrong. This is, without a doubt, one of the strongest strengths of this technique. It is really incredible how much it makes you root for the character because you hate seeing somebody down like that, especially played by somebody who we genuinely want to care for and root for. So when this happens, all we want to see is them overcome and prove wrong what they have been told. And yes, he does this more frequently than one might think, and he accomplishes more than just contextualizing with it. Sometimes the most terrifying thing that can happen in a story is to feel seen by the story. To read it, watch it, experience it, and realize that someone sees past the act that you put on every single day. They see you. They see what you think. They see what you feel. Most importantly, they see what you fear about yourself. You not telling me makes sense. Your sisters probably had a plan when they were alive, and when they were dead, you would probably be too scared to figure out what to do. So like a child, you just thought it would go away on its own. Lazuli not telling me that, that hurts. Because Lazuli I loved with all my heart. And this is just politics. Uh, I suppose you're glad, at least in part, that war is coming and you'll have something to do again. I'm gonna be better. What does that mean? I don't know. <sighs> Amethar the Unfallen. Let's see if Candia can earn the same title. Uh, and she walks out of the room. <laughs> Sometimes it is far more frightening to be seen than any monster, any killer, or any curse could be. One of the most incredible moments of this happening is when Brendan wasn't even on Dimension 20. No, instead, it's when he guest DM'd in the Exandria Unlimited series or on Critical Role, Calamity. In this story, well, he tells the story of how a bunch of people die. I don't think it's a spoiler warning because if you like Critical Role, you knew that. They were telling the story of how the world went to hell. Quite literally. And so most of the characters were meant to die. And festering wounds from schisms long since past. Surely they knew a distant future reckons. Surely they heard the howl of the calamity. How could they? The wheel must always spin, its gilded fulcrum rotting from within. When this happens, Brennan takes this chance to truly eviscerate one of the main characters in the party. Xerxes is a paladin who considers himself to be the most righteous, somebody who believes in his goals so much he has surpassed the need for an oath 
to others. He truly believes that he can accomplish things simply through his dedication to life itself. He is the most righteous, the most proud, the most devout of any paladin that has ever existed. And while most might find this valuable, even something to look up to, Brennan sees it as something to tear down. And so we get one of the most literally and figuratively brutal scenes ever depicted in a TTRPG live play. You begin to perform Ceremony of Atonement. The spell should be working. Uh-huh. And it's not. And he looks at you, and he, like, he can tell something is wrong. Like, he's looking at you, like, wondering what's up. Is something supposed to happen now? I don't know. What are you, what are you attempting to do? I want you to remember. Like you said, you remember everything. Yeah. I want you to remember who you were before. Yes. Before you came here. The nature of the, this nature of the ceremony, this is a ceremony of, of atonement, yeah. correct? Uh-huh. I see. I think I know what may be happening. What? The ritual of Evandrin, the resurrection, it didn't work because he, you tried to resurrect him, but he wasn't dead. Right. You're trying to atone me, and I didn't do anything wrong. Oh! And he stabs you through the heart. Oh! Was hated about mortals. You're wrong! I lay a hand on him and I cast a remove curse. This is not who you are! Who am I? You're not this! How have you forgotten? You have referred to yourself and your fellow mortals as our children. You are not our children. You are a bad first draft. First plan was to destroy this, to let you all fade into nothingness. That's not gonna be how we do it this time. You think that you are a man of true belief and that it's all these wizards around you that are humble. Who is the most proud man here? These ones who thought they would fly a city or the man who thought he would teach me a lesson. I'll tell you why I spit on your forgiveness. I'll tell you why I loathe your redemption. To reach a hand down to somebody, they need to be beneath you. And I'm beneath nobody. And he pulls the back of your head and rips the skin off of your skull. <laughs> Now there's a lot that happens in this scene. One, I mean, he literally reached behind the character's head and tore the skin off of his face. That's just kind of hard to get around. But it's the things that are said before this that truly make this such a brutal moment. He tears down what Xerxes believes, that Xerxes believes that this individual needs redemption. He spits in the face of redemption. Xerxes believed in true redemption. He insisted that the world could be saved. He believed that anyone was capable of redemption and grace. And this character looked him in the eye and said, who are you to believe yourself so prideful that you could save anyone? This world is not made for those of you who believe so highly of themselves. Not only this, he continues to belittle and destroy Xerxes, not just killing him, but killing him again and again and proving to him over and over that he is not such a powerful individual. This is not something for him. Xerxes is prideful to an absolute fault and he tears apart his pride. And while I said earlier that this was meant to bring a character down so that we could see the arc they're going to overcome, in this case, this was a tragedy. Literally, the story was a tragedy. It was meant to end in tragedy. So we don't really get to see that. While Xerxes attempts to overcome this, Ultimately, the story does not end well. And we get to see it instead become a story of foretelling what it's like to give in to your greatest pride and how that might bring a great fall. Do I, do I have a moment to do anything? You have a moment to do anything. Then you, I'm gonna cast a spell. What do you cast? I'm gonna cast Resilient Sphere on myself. 
Cool. Um, he counterspells it with a ninth level spell slot and <laughs> um, and smashes you into the floor and breaks your spine. He heals oh he God. heals you again and what? He what? Just keeps what? What? He heals you again. That's the He he breaks your spine, heals you, raises you back up, casts time stop again. I just want to remind everybody. Really <laughs> yeah. When I get when I get in between the time stops, buddy. Just, just let a girl know, like. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, he cast the second time stop in the first time stop. Oh, okay. He touched the time stop. He touched the time stop. He touched the time stop. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Another great use of this technique. It really is powerful. It is narratively intriguing and so fun to watch, but it is not something for everybody to use. But in order to describe why it's not something for everybody to use, we first have to describe exactly why Brennan does it. I've explained that it does create this moment for the characters to overcome, but it does more than that. It literally leaves no direction for the characters to go but up. Many times in our games, it's difficult to give the characters a direction to go to overcome their own difficulties. It's difficult to give the players a path to become the heroes because it's really understandably hard to play the hero. It's really difficult to know that you're doing the right thing. So when you tear somebody down this harsh and leave their weaknesses out to bear, the player knows exactly what they must do to overcome it. They must overcome this weakness, they must do better, they must rise up, they must face the occasion, they must become anew. They must change for the better. That's why Benning does this. It gives the characters a, such a clear path and it allows the characters to know with no uncertain terms the battle that they must fight, not physically, but internally. And they know what the dungeon master expects from them. They know what the player expects from them. Essentially, it puts everybody on the exact same page. Now, this being said, I stated in the beginning that this is not something to do without using extreme caution. So why? Well, the truth is, is you risk harming the player. Not just the character, but the player. By doing something like this, you are going after a character they've created that inevitably has a portion of themselves in the character. And by striking such a weakness, you may be striking the same weakness of the player in a visceral way meant to harm. That's dangerous. It doesn't matter if you're playing teacher RPGs or not, doing something like that to somebody is dangerous. So this must be something that is discussed beforehand. You cannot do this without at least being on the same page as the player. But at the same time, you also risk railroading what the player must do. If you tear them down like this, they feel like they only have one direction to go. They now need to overcome this flaw that they may not have even intended to do. And now, I mean, they feel like they're character has to do something to redeem themselves. What if that's not something they wanted to do? What if that was not the direction they intended? It becomes far more difficult, that's the case. But even worse is the third reason this is dangerous, you risk never giving them a payoff. Imagine taking this character, tearing them down to their core, and not running a tragedy such as Exandria and Limited Calamity. Maybe there's supposed to be an ending, but at the end, the character never gets to face that weakness. Now their story feels incomplete, and the character feels terrible, and the player feels terrible. It's a beat down with no comeuppance. The villain just tore them down and they never get to feel like they come out as the hero, just as somebody who maybe survived harm, which some people might want to tell that story, but many people do not. And maybe the player comes out feeling the same way. That's why this technique is dangerous. It revolves around needing perfect communication with your DM, which is fine. That's something that everybody should have, but not everybody does. Communicating with your DM is one of the most important things about playing these games in the first place. But communication is hard. Some of us are antisocial. Some of us don't know how to communicate properly. Some of us are still learning. And that's why you should not imitate the people that you see on actual plays, because they're playing in front of cameras. They're playing with the intention of creating an interesting story. And it's fun. I love talking about it. It's not something that you have to do though. We've told a story of the coming of a time of darkness, the coming of calamity, of shadow and fire and ruin. The purpose of playing is for us to connect with each other, to enjoy talking with each other, to enjoy playing a game and creating a story, to connect with the people at your table. That should be your priority, not imitating the cool thing that you saw happen. Is it a good thing to do? Of course, in the same way that imitating a powerful or amazing sports individual is. Sports individual, really? This is the nerdiest way I could have referred to that. Regardless, it's not a bad thing to imitate people who are good at their craft, but you are not them. That's typically not why people are indulging in hobbies. They're doing so to connect, 
to enjoy, to have something that brings them joy for that sake. So do that. And you can still learn and create incredible stories, but make sure you're being safe while doing so. Why do we tell stories? To try to make sense of a world that can be terrifying and enormous. In Exandria, I don't know that your story will long be known. I don't know who will remain to tell it, but it did happen and it did matter. And though calamity is here because of you, it will not be here forever. Thanks so much for watching. Because that truly is some of the most important stuff. So wife, wanna, wanna hit us with an outro? Like, comment, subscribe, Brennan Lee Mulligan for presidency. No, no, Brennan Lee Mulligan should not, I, we, uh, if you want to see why Brennan Lee Mulligan should not run for president, please feel free to click.